Everybody ready for today? Yeah. I have a special guest with me. Yeah, thanks for letting me crash your service. <laughs> As you, as you all know, we've been teaching the series uh, called, uh, what's it called? Still Going, yeah. Energizing Your Marriage, Energize Your Marriage to Last. And, and I told you at the beginning that at the end of the series, we would uh, address some of the questions that you guys sent in anonymously. And so we're going to do that today. Yay. Yeah. There were uh, a lot of questions. And so... Uh, we probably will not be able to get to them all, but we're just going to see how far we can get. And uh, hallelujah. Everybody on board? Yeah. Expectant? Can I say something? You may before? speak okay. as much as you want. One of the things that I noticed about the, a lot of the questions, not all of them, but they were about my spouse this, my spouse that. And I thought I covered that too. Well, I, I mean, I just wanted to, I just was kind of pondering on that, and I realized that when sin entered, then we began to blame, right? We began to blame Ooh. someone else. And, and when Jesus came, he took the blame. He didn't put it off onto someone oh. else. So our change begins in our life when we accept blame or responsibility and then do something to change. So. I think we're done. <laughs> that might have been worth coming to church today. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, let's see. Uh, what do we do as a married couple when we don't agree on parenting styles? We don't agree on parenting styles. I would say uh, that you should strive and make every effort to agree because uh, your kids uh, are hanging in the balance and there needs to be ag agreement as much as possible. Um, if there's not perfect agreement as far as, as it stated, styles or philosophies or, or so forth, you need to get to a place where you agree on what you're going to do. So you can, you have, if you don't agree on all principle, you can agree on practice. Okay, we disagree about this, but here's how we're going to deal with little Johnny, little Susie, right? Because there's got to be a consistency. If you don't have consistency with bringing up your children, you're going to mess them up. Yeah, criminals. And they're going to take advantage of you. <laughs> they will rule the roost, right? Yes. And, uh, and, and so, I mean, a suggestion, especially if you're talking about two people who mutually have respect for the Word of God, then say, we're going to set aside how you grew up, how you grew up, how we were treated, what we've thought, and we're going to search the Word of God together, you know, independently come together and take some time to do it. It's worth the time. Yeah. Take some weeks and say, we're going to look up all scriptures pertaining to children uh, a lot of them in the Proverbs, but of course you go into Ephesians as well, and you're going to look up scriptures about that. And then if you can agree to uh, abide by the wisdom and the word of God, then you have a foundation of an equal, equal uh, starting point. You think so? Yes. Yeah. So if we, if we can find it in the word, we'll agree to agree on it. If we can't find it in the word, then we're not going to make that the foundation of our parenting style. Ultimately, this isn't par a parenting seminar, but when it boils down to it, whatever you decide, you both, you still have to be the parents. Yes. <laughs> Don't relegate that to the children. Yes. Don't let them be the boss. Yes. Should my husband be going on a trip with his female best friend by themselves? We just answered that question. <laughs> that I kind of knew when I read answer. that that it would get that reaction. <laughs> so it might have just been answered. <laughs> so in short, no. <laughs> in a little bit longer, uh, you're... <laughs> Some extra O's? Yeah. Oh. 
A little bit longer of an answer. Uh, no husband should have a female best friend. Let me long, elongate that a little more. No husband should have a female friend. Let me say it longer. No wife should have a male friend. Now watch. Now, we may have a female friend. Right. Or we may have a male friend. My wife's not having bugs that are men. No, you're getting ready to go to the hotel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So independent of each other, we don't have, I don't have female friends. Ah, oh, she's my friend. I might refer to someone like they were way back before we were married. They were a friend. But in practice, no. Good? Yes. All right. Good. <laughs> Here's another one. Okay. If, if your husband is not saved and spirit-filled, is the wife the head of the house spiritually? Okay. Now, this is, this is a, actually kind of common, this, this, this thought process, but I don't see in the scripture where there's a spiritual head of the house. The headship in the home uh, has to do with, with uh, natural things. It's a physical thing, uh, domestic, rather than a spiritual head. So obviously, if you've got a, a Christian wife and an unbelieving husband, if there are kids involved, of course she's going to take the lead on giving them any kind of spiritual uh, you know, education and leading and so forth until hopefully they're all believing God for him to come in, until he can uh, assume that, that role and take some leadership in, in that regard. Uh, but as far as, as far as that goes, I'm not looking for a title to say, well, you're the spiritual head. Just be who you are. Just be a Christian and, and bring the God element into your home uh, the best you can. Yes. Any thoughts on that? I don't. All right. Go ahead. You do the next okay. one. Should marriage get easier over time? And <laughs> I will say we live in a fallen world and nothing that's alive gets better when it's left to itself. I, I have a garden, and some years I don't get out there often enough, and it becomes like this beast. Like, but if I go out there regularly and tend it, it does, it's easy, and, and it doesn't take much work. We were just talking about house cleaning. If you let it get out of control, it, all of a sudden it seems overwhelming. So it depends what you're doing with your marriage. So if you're tending to your marriage all the time, yes, it should probably get easier over time. But the other, the other problem that we could have is that we're elevating our marriage above our relationship with Christ. And then we're working on the marriage instead of, instead of our, our own spiritual condition, and then it becomes like a God almost. And, um, but I thought about the scripture in um, 2 Corinthians 3.18, where it says, we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. So at, we are supposed to get better and better in our walk with the Lord, so why wouldn't that transfer to our marriage, as long as we're keeping it in the correct order? Good, good. Hey, you guys, would you put up those scriptures that we sent you when, when, when we read them? In the booth back there? <laughs> They're not responding. There's a thumbs up, okay. We're good from here okay, on Okay, and then I have another question is, is it normal for couples to argue or healthy? No, well, maybe yes, <laughs> and no, it is not healthy. Um, we, we can disagree about things and not argue, but um, when, when there's an argument, when it's, you know, like, back and forth like that, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's not like, I think we should do this. Well, I don't agree, I, I think we should do this. I'm not talking about that, but like arguing where it's just, you know, well, you said thing. You and remember back. You know, just arguing. Um, it it's kind of rooted. Well, not kind of. It is rooted in selfishness. I I want my way. I want my. I'm right, and I'm going to prove that I'm right. And um, I, I just think about the scripture in James three sixteen, where it says, "Where envy and self seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there." So by arguing, I'm inviting a lot more into my home and into my life than I bargained for. 
And so sometimes it's, I, I had to give myself permission because in the moment I think I'm right, I'm right. And I want you to know that I'm right. Well, maybe I could just give myself permission to let him be wrong because I might find out later he was right all along and I was wrong. So it's like, does it really matter? Does it matter if he's wrong? Just let him be wrong, it's fine. Or, or vice versa. He can just let me be wrong. He doesn't have to correct everything and argue about everything about... Are you correcting me? No. Okay. <laughs> anyway. I think uh, sometimes when you ask a question, is this normal for us to be this way, you're looking for comfort because we fight a lot, we argue a lot, and I'm hoping everybody else does too. Then at least I know we're not totally failing. But at the same time, if you consider something to be normal, it almost is then allowed and expected. And I certainly wouldn't encourage that. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't allow or just be okay with constant arguments and, and fighting and so forth in your marriage. It doesn't have to be that way. And right. really it ought not. Uh, as you know, she mentions that, there's another one, not on the screen. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 13, which says only by, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, only by pride comes contention. So why do people argue? They're proud. What should proud people do? Humble themselves. Humble themselves. Humble themselves under the mighty hand of God. You know, one of the things that I was teaching last week about being a good person, being a good Christian before you get to the whole marriage relationship now that's a, a foundation. Um, uh, I've noticed this over the years. One reason why I don't do a marriage, you know, teaching or series or seminar or anything every year, I, I, I tie practically every message that we teach, every subject matter that we teach, that it, it connects to the marriage. If you'll get this, for example, when we taught on humility a while back, well, that wasn't a marriage series, was it? Well, not directly, but indirectly, yes. Mm -hmm. well, you know, you can tie any subject because you take two people and you grow them up, they mature spiritually, now you're a better husband, now you're a better wife. So th there, there's much to learn in, in, in that regard. Okay, here's another question. Uh, how do I lead a woman that doesn't want to be led? <laughs> uh, she is only focusing on the negative. Well, uh, <laughs> First, you wanna make sure that her lack of desire to follow you is not, uh, is not because of your faulty leadership. <laughs> In other words, again, you look back at yourself first yeah. and you say, is the way that I'm leading making it more difficult for her? Okay, because a, go a good leader is gonna use wisdom and they're gonna seek to do things in the right way because you can lead in an improper way or just make it really difficult and you don't want to do that. You wanna make it easy. You can't force them into a role or to do something, but you can analyze your own methods and the way, the way you approach things. And so uh, look, at, look at your own leadership. But then after that, you know, I say, if you're leading or you're trying to lead and she won't follow your leadership, lead anyway. What do I mean? Lead by example. Do the right thing yourself, independent of whether she will or not. Uh, make decisions, make, you know, thought out, godly, spirit-led decisions, make them, period. Well, she's not going to follow. Then do it anyway. Yeah. Well, what if, I, what if she won't come to church with me? Then say, tomorrow, you know, it's Saturday. Tomorrow we're going to church. Be ready at such and such a time we're leaving. See you in the car. <laughs> and say, well, she's not going to go. That doesn't, mean you don't, that doesn't mean you don't lead. You still led. You're not going to physically force her to do anything. You say, okay, well, we're going. Then go get in the car, wait a minute, and then leave. Yeah. If she doesn't follow. You're not going to force someone to follow, but you're still going to take leadership. You're going to pray. You're going to lead by example and do the things that you know to do. Yes. Amen. Amen. Good preaching, Pastor Mark. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I, this is just a nugget from my marriage family ministry class <clears throat> that submission can never be forced. It has to be given. Right. And so if, if we're talking about that in, in that context, like may, may, maybe my wife is not submitted to me, 
Well, it's not your job to make that happen. It's her job to make that happen. And so. Exactly. So stop trying <laughs> because you can't make someone submit. All right. This person says uh, their question is or their statement is my husband doesn't seem very sexually interested in me and he doesn't know why. Uh, well, I don't know why either. <laughs> I can surmise, I can say maybe, maybe there's something physically off with him, you know, hormonally, something like that. Could be something physically. Uh, that's not right, and you could check into that and see if that's, a, that's an issue. If it's not something that's physical, you know, I would probably look at other parts of the marriage, say, is are other parts of the marriage really off? And that's you know kind of sucking out the desire of, uh, of of those things. If everything else is wrong, and then that's expected to be you know on fire, uh, maybe that's a, a wrong expectation. Um, it is uh, important. I think most women know this, and men certainly know this. Uh, men are sight motivated and driven. And so it would be worth that observation um, for yourself. Are you taking good care of yourself physically? Some people let themselves go and they don't consider that to be important. I tell you, it's important to your husband. So, well, he says it's not. He's lying. <laughs> and so those are a few areas you can look at and you can, you, you can talk about. You want to add anything? Yeah, I, I mean... There could also be an unrealistic expectation set in if there's pornography involved. Okay. So maybe their needs are being met somewhere else, or it's causing um, expectations that the wife is unable to fulfill because they're unrealistic. So. Yes, indeed. What do you do if your husband won't go to marriage counseling? I'm not going. <laughs> I would go. If it, uh, well, I would, uh, I would ask, I think you should ask him if he has another solution. If there are marriage problems and he says, I'm not going to counseling, okay, what can we do? I mean, do we want to just leave things alone, let the garden grow its weeds? <laughs> Or are we, is there another suggestion you have uh, to, to fix our marriage uh, problems? Um, if that's off the table, maybe for pride or other reasons, is there a book we can read together? Is there a video series we can watch together? Could we, you know, get some other input that'll help us and give us some discussion subjects and maybe give us some objective uh, guidance from the outside, even if it's not... Uh, sitting down, and then, of course, you could go alone, which is not ideal, but it sometimes is better than nothing if it takes that. Indeed. Indeed. We have uh, some friends, this person says, to, that are widows, and they have decided uh, to stand before God and the church to be married without the state certificate. They want to know about that. I want to know why they want to do that. Yeah. What, what, why do you want to get married kind of off the grid? <laughs> I don't want to have a marriage license. I just want it to be before God. A lot of times people, Christians have done that. Uh, Christian singles have done things like that where they say, you know, because they want to sleep together and stuff, they'll say, well, we're married in, in God's eyes. And no, you're not. You're married in your own eyes. There's no real commitment there on this level. Why do you not want to get married the official way? How many know we are, we are supposed to follow the laws of our civil laws unless they, they contradict or violate the word of God? And so us being married with having a marriage license does not contradict the word of God. Back in Bible days, they had similar things uh, as today. Remember Jesus in... Uh, in John chapter 4, he was talking to the woman at the well, and, and he told her, uh, the woman said she wasn't married, and she said, I, I, have, she, I have no husband. He said, yeah, you've had five. 
and the one you have now is not your husband. In other words, Jesus was acknowledging that those marriages that were legal were real. They were, she, was, they were, she was married under the legal conditions of their day. And so, uh, and so I, I, I don't recommend this. I think that's the wrong way to go. I'm kind of surprised a church would recognize that as well. It says, well, we don't know if God they would. The we don't know if they would. Yeah. We don't know who these people are. Are you here? <laughs> Raise your hand. Go get married. <laughs> well, it speaks to me um, to a lack of commitment. Like, I don't want you, I don't want to commingle our finances. Uh, maybe there's problems with the, the children or whatever. It's like we're, we're sort of committing, but we're not really committing. Okay, here's another one. Uh, my husband has struggled with a porn addiction. Is watching pornography considered adulterous behavior? If he doesn't stop, is this biblical reason for me to file for a divorce? I think the, the, the foundation of this comes from uh, when Jesus made the statement in Matthew chapter 5, you have heard that it was said of, to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So it is a that lust is a heart level adultery. However, let me, let me just, let me tell you what I think. I don't believe that when Jesus made that statement, he was intending to license everyone for divorce who had a lustful thought. When he said that, he didn't also add, and if your spouse looks at any woman and lusts after her, you should file for divorce immediately because he's already committed adultery in his heart. It's a heart level thing. Here's what I'm saying. This is, a, this is a serious sin, but it doesn't, and it has consequences, but it's not uh, a get out of marriage free card. <laughs> uh, hopefully you don't want that. You just, you know, you just don't like the, this problem because it is a, a real problem. But no, I would not put that on the same level as someone physically committing adultery and you're saying you broke our covenant, it's over. Everybody with me? Okay, now I think it would be important for a lot of, uh, because men are often more subject to this. I know things are changing in our culture and demons are running rampant, but historically and typically and physically, men are more tempted by pornography than women are. And uh, I think it'd be good for some wives to know, and this is not to make it okay at all, but typically men don't view these things the same way you would. They have no uh, emotional investment. It's all physical. Whereas you think of things typically more emotionally, and that's, a, that's a, an emotional, um, uh, I don't know, uh, betrayal with him. It's just physical. That doesn't make it okay, but it might help you see things through a different lens. All right? Uh, on the woman's side, uh, I think women sometimes maybe are less tempted typically in that area visually, but sometimes can go there more emotionally with movies, with books, or novels, or fantasizing in that way from an emotional standpoint. That would also be a problem. Is it grounds for divorce? No, but it's a problem that'll hurt the marriage. Anything to add? I don't. All right. Let's see. Maybe... You answer this one. You answer it first anyway. Can a marriage that, that started as ungodly become godly? Or is there some truth to the whole divine spouse stuff? I've never heard of that. I, I kind You're of... The, I think she's the only divine spouse <laughs> I, that I, exists. I think I kind of understand them to be asking, like, is there a one? Like... Okay. Did God choose this person and I missed it or something like that? Um, I will say that before we all came to Christ, we were ungodly, right? And so when we got saved, the whole goal is to become more like Christ. And so our relationship with him gets more godly. That was the question, right? Godly. Yeah. Um, as we grow and mature and develop. And why can't our marriage do the same? Especially if we're both in that place of seeking the Lord, seek, or, or even if one person is just more, is, is seeking the Lord and becoming more Christ-like and mature, I think that will help to be, bring your marriage up. Um, 
But also, um, you know, we, is there a one person for me? Like, I, I don't know. I don't think so. I think there's probably a pool of people that are like, these people will all work. But don't choose any of these people. And sometimes we do, right? The Lord's maybe leading us toward one person or one type of person, and we just do our own thing. Or we were, weren't saved. Well, it doesn't matter. That it doesn't matter because once you married that person, they became the one. And so now my job isn't to question whether I should have married them. My question is, how do I make this marriage amazing? And so what can I do from here on out to, to make this spouse the yeah. one God chose for me? <laughs> yeah. And I would just say, you know, the answer is yes, a couple can turn to the Lord and have a godly marriage, even if they were ungodly in the beginning. Like, to Amy's point, here's a, a, a passage to be mindful of, 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 15. Paul says, to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if a brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace." So the, the main point I emphasize from this passage in context of this question is when at least when one spouse turns to the Lord and is saved, they bring something into the home that wasn't there before. This, the home is set apart. The other person is sanctified, if you will. They're not saved because of your spouse, but they are set apart for, for God's uh, involvement just because you've got a believer in the house. Yeah. The kids take on a greater uh, influence from God because there's one believer in the house. So, uh, yes, things can turn, things can get better, and praise the Lord. If there is continuous emotional or physical abuse, what should be done? If there is physical abuse, uh, one should get out of the house. What, you, uh, you are not to be a punching bag. You are not to stay in that situation where there's danger and physical harm. Uh, get, get out and, and then seek counsel. Go to a pastor, go, seek wisdom as to what to do next, but don't stay there and get beat up, okay? I know there's, that's a, that can be a deeper subject, but, but that, if someone's say, well, it's, it's emotional abuse. Can, can you leave, should you leave if there's emotional abuse? No shouldn't leave. I mean, th he, he, someone looks at the other person wrong nowadays and they feel abused. I, I don't mean to minimize that there aren't, isn't truly some verbal things that are very hurtful and harmful, but you don't, you don't leave someone because they spoke to you in, incorrectly or harshly. You pray for them. You love them. You use the model of your life as, as Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3, a believing wife can win her husband because of her lifestyle, because of her godliness and so forth. That's how you win that turkey over. <laughs> Amen. And so uh, physical, get out of there. Emotional, no, stay there. Yeah. And believe God and do the right thing and let's uh, believe God for change. Not to make the emotional uh, okay or minimize it. It's a, it's a real deal, sometimes. Amen. You, who's up next? You. Me. What does it mean for the husband to be the head of the wife? Uh, it means he's the leader. It means he's the highest authority in the home. That's what that means. It doesn't, it doesn't go into standing between the wife and God. Because mm -hmm. in Christ, there's neither male nor female. So husband and wife equally access to the, equal access to the father, and it, so it's not a spiritual head. It's, it's, it's in natural terms. Anytime you have two, two heads, right? Two-headed is a freak, <laughs> right? You can't have two heads, you gotta have one. And most of the time, a husband and wife are gonna work as a team, and they work together. I would say most of the time, all the time. But there will be occasion where, as the head, uh, the husband is going to make the final call, 
He's going to make the decision. He's going to hear from God and take the leadership in that way. Yeah. Good. You go, girl. <laughs> okay, what are possible challenges that may come with going into a marriage without knowing and having a good example of what it's supposed to look like? Is there any way to prevent issues that come with only having negative images of marriage and wanting it to be good? And uh, it's, this is very real. I mean, I think there are definitely a lot of negative images of marriage in our world and that surround us. And we have to guard against it, but it's just like anything else. Um, we live in a fallen world, and our ideas in, in, in many areas are shaped wrongly by the images that we see from the world. And so we have to displace that with what the Word says. And uh, I really like this um, scripture from the Message Bible. It's 1 Corinthians 10, 5, and 6. And it says, we use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. And our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience into maturity. And so we need to be getting more, we need to be getting more of our information about marriage from what the word says than from what we have seen. And so if you recognize that you did not grow up with a good um, example of marriage, then you need to be surrounding yourself with tools to help you renew your mind. Meditate on Ephesians 5, uh, read a marriage book, Join a marriage life group. Become friends with people who have a good marriage. Do whatever you can to replace those images and thoughts and things that you've seen and patterns that you've learned. And also recognize that there's probably some stuff that you don't realize that is in you because of, it became a pattern of what you saw all the time. And be ready to root those things out when they come. Good. Good. Good answer. Uh, this person writes... I assume that married couples should communicate about everything. Is there anything they should not communicate about? Yes. In other words. Says the non-talker who's married to a talker. <laughs> <laughs> what say you? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> yes, you should not say everything that yes. crosses your mind. That's a good rule for life. <laughs> Not everything you think should be vocalized. Um, there can be times when you have some situations at work and you should leave it at work. In other words, it's not healthy communication. It's not necessary information. It's just become a, gonna become a burden to them. Sometimes you, need, sometimes you may need their support or help, but sometimes you realize, you know, I don't need to make make uh, her my, my trash can today, <laughs> and uh, she's got a lot going on, and that's just called being wise. She's got a lot going on, and she doesn't need this extra thing to deal with, so I'm just going to not burden her with it. There could be some things that you avoid. At the same time, should you talk about everything? Well, you shouldn't complain. I mean, you shouldn't gossip. You know what I heard today? I heard da, 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 da. A lot of husbands and wives gossip with each other. Okay, so that shouldn't happen. That's because we're Christians. Hallelujah. I, I will add this. Just because you shouldn't, you really shouldn't communicate about everything, it doesn't mean there's things that are off limits. Right. So if I ask, he should tell me, or vice versa. If he asks There, there are no me, secrets. Right, right. Yeah. There's no area. I, I can't have an area of my life that's off limits to her and vice versa. No, all information is accessible. There's no secret. You don't have an email address that they don't know about. Ooh. Uh, or, or some kind of hidden part of your life that they don't know about. That's not called being married. That wasn't the question, but that plays in. Thank you for that addition. Should we do one more? Sure. All right. Which one do you want to do? Well... You know what, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, uh, we're not, we have more questions and what we, what we may do is next service, answer some of the ones we didn't get to. And what you can do, if you want, later today or this week, go on and listen to the 
at the next service if you want to hear some additional questions that we didn't cover in this service. Good? Mm -hmm. Good? You got, you got a favorite to finish with? Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I'll, I'll do this one. Hopefully, I can. I can hopefully, okay. Um, this one says, as a young adult, how can I best surround myself with couples who are great examples of marriage? I find that most people are busy with their own lives, but I desire to have exam examples of healthy married couples. And I really like this question because I, I hear a lot, of, especially there's a certain age group that really is looking for mentors. And they, you know, I need a mentor, I want a mentor. I, and, the, and, and you'll hear people complain about nobody will mentor me or I can't find a mentor. And my question is, how badly do you want the information? Because if you want it, if you, if you want something and you're not willing to give up something to get it, then you don't really want it. And so, um, you know, I think most people are probably willing to let you into their life on their terms. So if you say, hey, can I come wash your car? Hey, um, are you in a life group? Can I join the life group that you're, you and your wife, husband, whatever, go to? Can I babysit your kids? Can I take you guys to dinner? You do it on their terms. You don't make them conform to your schedule. So finding out what their schedule looks like and even being willing to spend really what we would consider meaningless time. Hey, could I come over for a couple hours, just hang out? Like, I, I think most people, if they understand what you're trying to do, would be willing and open to that. And I do know that um, we invest in things that matter to us, so if we want to change what matters or make something matter more, we have to be willing to divert our time, our resource, our treasure, our our talent toward that thing. So if you're wanting godly examples in your life, you have to invest some time, some money, some to, to get into that, um, into, an, into that environment with anything. So if you want a mentor, don't make someone conform to you, you conform to them. Good word. Father, I thank you today for working in the lives of every person present.